grace and peace to you this day. I hope this finds you well and appropriately isolated. This continues to be a trying time for so many folks as we continue to learn the breadth of effects of COVID-19, whether it is the fear of the virus itself, the strain in the healthcare system, the widespread economic effects of isolation, or the difficulty of staying cooped up at home. And one of the many challenges of it is that we don't know when this time will end. And it's hard to run a race without knowing where the finish line is, but that's what we find ourselves doing. It is in this time of chaos that we enter into Holy Week, starting today with Palm Sunday, then continuing with Maundy Thursday and the story of the Lord's Supper, and then Good Friday and the crucifixion, and then, in just one week, we get Easter. While there is much that I lament this week not being able to gather together in person, I am actually really looking forward to moving through this story that is the foundation of our faith at such a time as this. So as we enter into this virtual worship, let us pray. Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. Inspire us to die to ourselves, putting aside our own desires so that we might care for our neighbors and be a means of new life for them. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Here ends the first reading. And our second reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our second reading. And our gospel today is from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. 
Here ends our gospel reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday, and any other year we would start this service gathered outside together, palm branches in our hands, proclaiming Hosanna in the highest and then parading into the sanctuary singing hymns of praise. The song that we opened with this morning is one of those hymns from years past, actually. We do all of this remembering Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem from our gospel today. Our gospel is actually just a short gospel compared to some other options that we had that take us through the entire uh, passion narrative, all the way through Jesus' crucifixion, but I'm going to leave those readings for Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and invite you into those services then. I want to lean into today the irony of Palm Sunday. For those of us who know the story, it is these same people who praise Jesus as King in our gospel today, who celebrate him and yell Hosanna and lay palms and clothes on the ground so that even the feet of the donkey he rides doesn't touch the ground. It is those same people who just days later will call for his crucifixion. Why do you think that is? Yes, there is certainly manipulation by the leadership, but that can't be the only thing that's happening. And I think a big piece of what turns people against Jesus in our gospel uh, and in Jerusalem at the time is that he doesn't live into their expectations. Not that he doesn't live up to their expectations, because I believe ultimately he does more than they expect but he doesn't live into their expectations. He doesn't do what they think he would or should do. They wanted a conquering king, someone who would be like David before him, raising armies and casting out oppressors, bringing economic prosperity, who would rule with might and power. But that isn't who Jesus was or is. Certainly a king who can be arrested and ultimately crucified is not the king that they wanted or expected but he is the king they got. I think we often deal with similar disappointment in Jesus not living into our expectations. And I imagine it will be one of the things that many folks wrestle with throughout this current pandemic. I'm not even talking about Christians not living into expectations because we all know how often that's the case. But we often place expectations on how we think Jesus should act. When loved ones are sick, and we are desperate for their healing and pray fervently for it, we are disappointed in Jesus if it doesn't come. I've seen this exact scenario turn people away from lives of faith. When we see injustice in the world that surely goes against the kingdom of God that Christ came to usher into the world, we often cannot fathom why Christ would let it remain and so turn away from faith, not able to live in the tension. Certainly these days, it's just about the entire world is dealing with this pandemic on some level or another. We would want, even expect, Jesus to work a miracle in order to bring healing to a world that is scared and hurting. And maybe he will. It does seem to fit with what God wants for the world. But a lack of a grand miracle does not mean a lack of Christ being at work. I certainly think that Christ is at work and doctors and nurses on the front lines fighting the virus in hospitals, and grocery store employees who have become more emergency personnel than they ever thought possible, and Instacart deliverers and Amazon employees and all the folks who have felt their demand ramp up, and they have responded to this drastic change in culture over the past few weeks. For all the folks changing business models, and all the social service agencies working hard to respond to a soaring need, I think Christ is absolutely at work in all of this, bringing the healing and the relief that we pray for. But all of this isn't necessarily the way we want Christ to work. We tend to want something grand and instant, like the people of Jerusalem might have wanted, and we can easily get frustrated that Christ is not at work in that way, but often more so in the undercurrent of grace and coming alongside people in need and walking with them in their pain and grief, and the promise of abiding, of never leaving us alone, no matter the situation that we're in or the anger we might feel towards God. 
Our disappointment makes sense, really, and usually comes from a good place, often wanting the same things that Christ wants for the world, healing, justice, wholeness. But when it comes, uh, when it doesn't come the way we think it should, we are left not much different than the people in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Maybe not calling for Christ's death, but certainly thinking we may not need him after all. I say most of this not as some judgment against us for not getting it, but, but more to urge patience and perspective. Patience and the understanding that just because Jesus isn't showing up the way we think he should or on the timeline that we would like, it doesn't mean he's not showing up. We have uh, a week to wait for Easter and the celebration of resurrection, but currently we already live in a resurrection reality. And the promise of new life is not one reserved for only after we die, but it is also what God wants for and works for the world today. So be patient, because God is at work moving us to new life. And I urge perspective because, as I said, God is already at work. Mr. Rogers uh, was once quoted as saying that when he was a kid and he would see scary things in the news, his mother would tell him to look for the helpers. You will always see people helping. Though we may not see God working the way we would want or expect, that does not mean God is not at work. And quite often, God is at work in the helpers. And there are countless stories of helpers of all sorts these days, and even more that will go untold. God is most certainly at work if we shift our perspective from grand miracles to the often unseen everyday miracles of people showing up for one another when they don't have to or when they, they have to sacrifice much in order to do so. And remember that as children of God, we are called to be the helpers as well, to be Christ's hands and feet, bringing the promise of new life to our neighbors in whatever way we can. This week's narrative, Moving Throughout Holy Week, is the core of our story as Christians, the message that we cling to, especially in hard times. It is the story of God's love for God's people and for the creation that God has made. Christ is here, in our midst, the King of King, the Lord of Lords. May our eyes be opened to see and give praise. Amen. I now invite you, as we join together in prayer, to respond wherever you are. Each petition of the prayer ends with the words, Hear us, O God, and you are invited to respond with the words, Your mercy is great. And so now, turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of mercy. Awaken your church to new proclamations of your faithfulness. By your Spirit, in the midst of fear and suffering, give us bold and joyful words to speak, that we sustain the weary with the message of your redemption. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, quiet the earth where it trembles and shakes. Protect vulnerable ecosystems, threatened habitats, and endangered species. Just as you desire health and wholeness for your people, prosper the work of scientists, engineers, and researchers who find ways to restore creation to health and wholeness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, drive away fear and anger that cause us to turn against one another. May the suffering of many be a rallying cry as we seek to respond in such a way that brings relief to body, mind, and spirit. Give courage to leaders to make difficult decisions for the sake of those they serve and to the world beyond their borders. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, send your saving help to all who suffer abuse, insult, discrimination, or contempt. Heal the wounded, comfort the dying, bring peace to those suffering chronic or terminal illness and to their loved ones who suffer with them. Tend to all who cry out for relief, especially those around the world affected by the current pandemic. Hear us, O God. 
your mercy is great. God of mercy, we pray for all who work to proclaim your love and grace in the midst of anxiety. In all things, show us the ways that you call us to die to self, to live for you, and to give of ourselves for the sake of others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, when we breathe our last, you raise us to eternal life. With all your witnesses in heaven and on earth, let us boldly confess the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrection and our hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I now invite you to join together as we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and grant you love and peace. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor.